We are trying to learn about love languages. So over the course of a five-week period, uh, uh, our associate pastor James and I, we are taking a look at the ways in which we naturally give love and then accept love. And we see it expressed in five different ways. Uh, James already covered uh, the second topic of quality time, giving quality time to people last week. Two weeks ago, I talked about acts of service, ways in which we can serve one another. And today, we're going to be looking at giving gifts. And then over the next two weeks, it's encouraging words as well as the act of physical touch. Now, which one of these is the one that most naturally comes to you? Which is the way in which you receive love the best? Or even, how is it, which way is it that you give love the best? How many of you would actually say giving gifts is the way in which you show your love to those around you in the best way? So, okay, we have a few. Most of us, it's receiving gifts. So uh, I have a gift to give out here this morning. We had one fortunate individual at the first service, and this isn't something to throw away. It, it, it's uh, something that's worth around $30. So it, it, it's pretty special to hold on to. One, two, three, four. But I, uh, no, it's you. You're in that seat. I had that seat picked out three days ago. So they're just a stipulation. You have to stay awake during my sermon. And you can't open the box until after the service is over. And then there's a third stipulation. You can't shake the box because you might figure out what's inside. But, but that's your gift. Now, when Shaheen came in here today, he had no idea that he would receive a gift like this. And... There's nothing like receiving an unexpected gift. And if Shaheen's top way of, of receiving love is through the giving of gifts, then this is a great feeling for him. And I'm sure that he can't wait until I finish speaking so that he can open up that gift. So as we've been looking at Gary Chapman and these love languages that he calls them, what we are trying to do is imitate Jesus and love like Jesus. And this week we're going to focus on giving gifts. And there are some people that couldn't care less what you do for them. You could serve in many ways for them. It doesn't thrill them at all. And they're... Maybe even quality time doesn't really do much for them. But if you give them a gift, all of a sudden you've just risen up that ladder of favoritism in their eyes. If you've taken the time to pick out and purchase something for them, it's more important to them than anything you could ever say or do. Now, almost everything written on the subject of love indicates that at the heart of love is the spirit of giving. And Jesus gave a wedding gift, and it was something that was greatly appreciated. In fact, this was the very first miracle that he performed. So we have it in John chapter 2. Two days later, there was a wedding in the town of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his followers were also invited to the wedding. And when all the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. And Jesus answered, Dear woman, why come to me? My time has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you to do. In that place there were six stone water jars that the Jews used in their washing ceremony. Each jar held about 20 or 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled the jars to the top. Then he said to them, Now take some out and give it to the master of the feast. So they took the water to the master. When he tasted it, the water had become wine, and he did not know where the wine came from, but the servants who had brought the water knew. The master of the wedding called the bridegroom and said to him, People always serve the best wine first. Later, after the guests have been drinking a while, they serve the cheaper wine. But you have saved the best wine till now. So in Cana of Galilee, Jesus did his first miracle. There he showed his glory, and his followers believed in him. So the disciples, 
Jesus and Jesus' mother are all at this wedding celebration and this reception that is taking place. And the beverages run out at the reception. And for people of Jesus' day, a wedding was a big thing because they never had very many opportunities to be able to celebrate, to be able to get a much-needed reprieve from their overworked and underpaid lives. So there weren't many events where they could relax with old friends and just enjoy some food, drink, and fellowship. So being out of wine wasn't a good thing. And have you ever noticed how weddings are high-stress times? My mother-in-law pretty well blew a gasket over the stress of our wedding, and you couldn't go much simpler than what we did. We had a budget of $1,000. Now, in 1980, Eighty, $1,000, you financial people could figure out what that is in today's money. But we had $1,000. Pat's dress was $200. It was a beautiful dress. Her maid of honor wore a dress that my cousin wore in a wedding she was in earlier. And then uh, my brother and I, we were looking great in our suits at the front. And then Pat's brother was our usher, and he borrowed a suit from someone. He, was, he grew up in the hippie generation, so he borrowed a suit from someone, and then he said he got his hair cut just for the wedding, but it was still down to here. And, uh, and then uh, the wedding took place at the church that my father-in-law was pastor of, so we didn't have to pay any rental fees, didn't have to pay for him to perform the ceremony. Although there was a temptation, because I took a class from him in college, and he mentioned how whenever he is given money for performing a wedding, he always gives the money back to the bride. And then he says, here, this is how much your groom thinks of you. So I was going to write him a check for a million dollars, but then I was afraid that he might not give it back. <laughs> So the Akita Club, that was a middle-aged women's group. They catered to the wedding. Uh, there are 65 guests. The cake was $85, and the photographer was 150 See, wouldn't it be nice to do a wedding that way today? But Wilma still found a reason to get upset, because that's what weddings are like. The potential for problems are exceptionally high. There are so many things that could go wrong. There's so much anxiety. People are nervous and want to make sure everything goes just as they want it to. So it also carries over to the reception. Will the sound system work? Will there be enough parking? Will there be enough to eat and drink? And that's where we're at today with this predicament in John chapter 2. Now, we don't know if the wedding planner just miscalculated the numbers or if some people stayed longer and had more to drink than they expected. Or maybe there were some wedding crashers that came in and they were dehydrated and they drank a lot of what was there. We can only speculate, but we just know that the host and hostess are about to experience a social dilemma. Now remember this, back in that culture, wine it was a lot different than what we think of today. It was safer to drink than water, and back then, even after fermentation, it was far less than half the alcohol content of what we have today. So drunkenness was culturally unacceptable. In fact, it, it, because of the alcohol content, it took a lot of work to actually get drunk. On the day that the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles and the church began, and they started to speak in languages unknown to them, others were saying, oh, these guys are drunk. And Peter said, no, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. There's no way. And basically he was saying we would have to drink all day. So here we have a major problem. And Jesus is approached by his mother. She goes to her son because she knows that her son is the only one that can help out in this emergency. And I wondered, like, had he performed some amazing things around the house, but not yet out in public? But she just recognized that he was able to step in and do something here. But Jesus hesitated. And, but she said, Jesus, it's time. These people need what only you can do. And he didn't hesitate because he wasn't generous, 
but because he realized this was a supernatural gift. And there would be incredible implications if he performs this miracle right now. People would be talking about it. And the story just wouldn't be contained in Cana. And then it would be retold by so many. And if he gave that gift now, everywhere he went, people would be wanting similar and even greater miraculous gifts. So he seems uncertain that now is the right time for him to begin that kind of ministry. And we say this all the time, timing is everything. And that's what Jesus was thinking. So his response to his mom was, dear woman, why come to me? My time has not yet come. But his mother presses the issue in a different manner, just as moms do. My mother and I would be somewhere, and someone would be struggling with this really heavy weight, and she would look at me, Gregory, are you going to go over and help them with that? So when I got Gregory, that meant, okay, you do something. Your mother wants you to act. So in verse 5, Mary is basically doing that with Jesus, and she says to the servants, you guys do whatever he tells you to do. So Jesus now moves from wedding guest to the wedding planner. And on this day, rather than saving the world from sin, he starts his ministry of miracles by saving the day, is what he did. So in in so doing, he reveals for the first time that he has miraculous powers. And now I'm going to try and draw three principles from this gift that Jesus gave here, and so that we can model them. And the first one was that Jesus was sensitive to the need. At first appears that he isn't, but the more he sensed his mom's persistence, the more he sensed upon closer investigation that this was something that he could actually help out in. There was a real need. If you aren't naturally wired to express love through gift giving, you probably won't be as aware of the needs of others. Your antenna won't be up, kind of searching around, trying to find people that are in need or noticing that people have a need and then giving them an unselfish gift or your anonymous generosity. See, some of you underestimate the power of gift giving and perhaps you just haven't been the recipient of some meaningful gift And that's unfortunate if that's the case. Or maybe it's because you've clung too tightly to the things of this world and you have a tough time giving those to others. So can you think of a time when you saw someone in need and your heart was moved to fill that need and you willingly stepped in and you made a difference with a gift? It was an incredible feeling, wasn't it? It's fun to receive a gift, as Shaheen has done here this morning. It's not as much fun when you have one given and then taken away. So if I went to him and I said, I've changed my mind on the gift and I want it back again, he'd probably be gracious and not hold on too tight because he's got over 100 people watching him here. But maybe he'd say... I'm not so sure I really want it to be sponsored, by, to be resettled by this family here in Canada. But, but I wonder what you could do. I wonder if there are some people that you could help out. Could you find some young couple? They're just starting out in marriage, and you can help them out with furniture or some other items that they need, or maybe it's some financial needs. Or maybe there's a single mother, and we have a number of them in our church. They're juggling work, and they're juggling kids. Is there some way that you could help them out? Or maybe it's an elderly aunt or a new family in the neighborhood. Maybe you buy the meal for the person in the line behind you at the drive through just, just look for ways to give that gift of love. Prior to COVID, our church was a shining example at the local food bank. It's called the Halifax West Ecumenical Food Bank. We gave the most amount of groceries to the food bank, but COVID really got us off track. It got us on track in a number of other ways. We grew numerically. We grew financially during those times when we couldn't even be together, and we also added two staff members, but it really has hit 
are giving to the food bank. So I encourage you, when you're out shopping towards the end of the week, just grab a few extra items. In the newsletter, we talk about things that are most important, that are most wanted, and you could buy some of those, bring them. We have a box here in the cafe. But I think all of this begins with us paying attention to people's needs or wants, and that's how we communicate love. Learning enough about a person to give him or her what would mean something to them. And then secondly, we note that Jesus was actually creative in this, the packaging. He could have turned the water into wine in a different way, but he creatively involves the master and the servants. He could have just simply touched the containers and would have produced wine. He could have had a large, loud prayer and would say, I am now turning water into wine, but he didn't do any of that. He just asked the servants to fill those jugs to the brim and then to go and serve the host that evening. Now, the wise men, they brought created gifts to Jesus because they wanted to express love and honor the future king. And back in the Old Testament, in 2 Kings excuse me, actually 2 Samuel 24. This is what David said. But the king answered Arona, No, I will pay you for the land. I won't offer to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So he wanted to give a gift. He wasn't going to accept the free gift of that land for him to offer a sacrifice. He wanted it to cost him something. And Jesus was creative in his giving. Remember the time that he fed 5,000 men and then the women and children that would have been there with them? Probably 20,000 people. He could have just miraculously made them all feel full when it was mealtime. But instead, his disciples found this little guy. He was out fishing and he had two loaves of, excuse me, five loaves of bread and two fish. And Jesus then miraculously turned that into enough food to feed that crowd. So then there was another time when the disciples were having no luck fishing, and he said, go out again, just throw your nets over on the other side of the boat, and the, the nets were filled. So he, and then there was another time when there was a discussion about taxes, and Jesus said this in Matthew 17. However, we don't want to offend them, so go down to the lake and throw in a line. Open the mouth of the fish, the first fish you catch, and you will find a large silver coin. Take it and pay the tax for both of us. So he just could have reached into his pocket, and there's the money to pay the taxes. But no, go down, fish, and the first fish you catch is going to have a coin in its mouth. So he was constantly doing that type of thing. He was creative. And if we are going to love like Jesus then we are going to need to be creative as well. But parents, there's a warning here because don't go overboard with your children in this love language because there's a happy medium there. If you give your children everything they want, there's a term that describes that and it's called spoiling them. And if you try to keep up with what other parents are giving their kids at school or maybe in the neighborhood, you're giving for the wrong reasons. And through times, you're Your kids will sense that, and eventually they'll come to expect material gifts. Most kids will appreciate a creative gift more than an expensive gift, and it becomes more memorable as well. So thinking creatively is important in communicating love. Anybody can give a gift, but a creative gift takes a lot more effort and communicates a lot more love to the individual. I didn't seek permission to show this card from my granddaughter, but it was on Facebook, so I think that's available for all. So she gave this to her teacher. Dear Miss Doyle, it was pretty close on that, you are the best teacher I have ever had. I hope you like being a teacher a lot. I love you so much. And then, I don't know if that's 10 cents or $10 in Canadian tire money, but that could be valuable. So we we have a lot of teachers in the congregation. And would you rather receive that or another chocolate bar or or something like that? A, A creative gift is much more accepted and loved. And then also notice that Jesus was humble in the giving. 
What was the purpose of the giving of this gift? It, it wasn't to create attention for himself. It wasn't to impress others. It wasn't to satisfy himself. It wasn't to win the favor of other people. The purpose was to actually help out because there was a need. A gift given in love is always for the benefit of others. Now, I struggle in this a bit because I like to engineer surprises and I like to see people, oh, and, and, and I like to see my wife cry. And I, I, I did it on our first, uh, first Christmas after we got married. We never had so much money as back then. I was in Bible college, but I was getting... Uh, uh, what do you call them, bursaries, to go to there. And then I was also going to university and getting money for playing hockey. I had more money than I was paying in my tuition. And Pat was the payroll manager for the city of Charlottetown. A job, if I hadn't pulled her away from and gone into the ministry, and I won't even try to think how much she might be making today, but I bought her earrings, that uh, diamond earrings that first Christmas. And I could have put them in a little box, but I said, no, I got a big box and then took one of my old hockey jackets and put the earrings into the pocket of one of them just to be creative and, and make some suspense. And then I was able to get her to three bridal showers that were all surprise showers without her knowing about any of them. One of them was this Akita club. One was my family members. And then I got her to one that her friends were putting on. And I knew that her friends and coworkers were all going to be dressed up. And we were supposed to go to a church service that night but she has cords on. I said, well, don't you think we should dress a little better? Well, I'm going to sit up on the balcony. So I got her to the house and sent her off with her cords on. And then I surprised her with a, I can't give you all of these, a sewing machine one time, and the tears were flowing on that. But I love to see the surprise on people's face. But Jesus wasn't going for that in this story. He wasn't going pro for production or the show. And Jesus seems to be encouraging us to be more into silent, unseen, anonymous giving that, so that no one on earth may know about it. But rest assured, our Heavenly Father will know about that. Matthew 6, 1-4. Be careful when you do uh, good things. Don't do them in front of people to be seen by them. If you do that, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to the poor, don't be like the hypocrites. They blow trumpets in the synagogues and on the streets so that people will see them and honor them. I tell you the truth, those hypocrites already have their full reward. So when you give to the poor, don't let anyone know what you are doing. Your giving should be done in secret. Your father should see what is done in secret, and he will reward you. That is to be the purpose of our giving. It's not to draw attention to us. But gifts are visible, tangible symbols of love. And to the individual whose primary love language is receiving gifts, the cost of the gift will matter little. And when we are the giver, whatever gift we give, we are saying, I just want you to know that I love you and I appreciate you. And there's no need for fanfare. We just do it because we want to. We need uh, uh, to fulfill that need. We want to be creative and we want to give humbly. Have you ever seen, the, the while well, you're looking at greeting cards, and you're looking for one for a close friend or relative, and there are all kinds of categories. You've got birthdays and anniversaries, a newborn child, sympathy cards, congratulations on something else. But I've noticed that they've added another category, and it's called just because. So in other words, I'm buying this card, not because it's your birthday or your anniversary or you've just been baptized or you've, you're retiring. I'm doing this to try and communicate to you love and genuine concern and appreciation. And there's a good way to sum up how Jesus showed love through his gift giving at that wedding. And it was just because. It wasn't absolutely necessary that he produce more wine for the end of that reception. He, he changed that water into wine to give glory to God. And because of that miracle, his disciples put their faith in him. And maybe it was just because Jesus wanted to show these people his love by giving them a gift. 
Maybe Jesus decided he was going to show this love language when he created the world. And just because when he did that, he made the world beautiful, the sunset so beautiful, even though he didn't have to do that. God could have chosen to make the world flat, but he, just because he decided to put in beautiful mountains and, and valleys into the landscape, he could have done so many different things. He, he could have not given us the sense of taste or smell. We would have been able to survive, but it allows us to enjoy this life so much more. And it's all just because. So God goes over and above all the time. He always does more than he has to because he loves when he gives his gifts and sees them bring a smile to our faces. So the Bible says that God is the one who is the giver of every good and perfect gift. It's kind of interesting that in the Greek language, the word for gift is the same word for grace. It's charis. And Jesus excels in the giving grace. And when he gave this love gift, he showed love to ease this mother's anxiety, to save those parents social embarrassment, to help a young couple get their marriage started off on the right foot, to give the community some pleasure in being able to celebrate together. So he gave a gift that would be remembered for the rest of that family's life and one that would be remembered by all of us as well. And the Bible says that the best was saved for the last. So what was the end result? I think the lesson for us to learn in this miracle is that Jesus doesn't do anything mediocre. He doesn't do anything status quo, average. That can never describe the son of the living God. Remember what Paul said in Ephesians 3. With God's power working in us, God can do much, much more than anything we can ask or imagine. And we might have this idea of what God could do, and it's at this level, but he just goes beyond that. He can do much, much more. A young server at a restaurant told about a time when she left the restaurant, and she noticed this homeless man. And before she left the restaurant, she had taken this bottle of cold water out of the fridge, and she gave it to the man. And then she said he was so appreciative, and I... I can't describe how good I felt. And it was just so small, but I felt so good about it. So she said the next afternoon when she left the restaurant, she grabbed another bottle of cold water, hoping to be able to find that man again. And you know why she felt so good? It's because she was created in the image of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God has hardwired into our DNA the ability for us to sense fulfillment when we show love to someone else. And when we love like Jesus, we begin to look like Jesus, and people will see that resemblance, and we will then sense ourselves what difference we are making in the world. God has given you a gift, and I just don't know if you've opened it and received it yet. Although our friend from the beginning of the service has yet to open his or her gift, your gift is available for you. And maybe before you leave the building here this morning, you can have this gift. There are some of you who have waited until the end of the service and have never opened your gift. Jesus was the gift. He gave the gift of himself to pay for our sins and our forgiveness. This last scripture, 2 Corinthians. Thanks be to God for his gift that is too wonderful for words. I love the way the translation puts that. His gift is just too wonderful for words. We can't describe it. So whether it is the freedom that we have in him, the forgiveness of sins, the eternal life, if you have never accepted that gift, please do that. Talk to James. Talk to myself. And we will guide you into developing a relationship with Jesus.